Well, uh, <laughs> I'll try to be coherent. <laughs> and I don't know exactly where we're going, but wherever it is, <laughs> we'll be okay. But if I say anything that you don't agree with, that's just really what it is, right? <laughs> because I really am crazy, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> really. I flew with the eagles until I fell from the nest. I ran with the wolves, then got lost from the pack. Slowly I go crazy every day. Some days run faster than others. I never strayed into heaven. It was hard getting past hell. I traveled through and beyond the death and birth of man. I am Iktomi. Imagine running out of imagine, mistaking authority for power, weaving life's free spirit into patterns of control. I heard all that was said, until now I hear nothing at all. The edge between twilight and dark, the great lie lurks. Prostitution of soul, anyone can do it or not. I went down some roads that stopped me dead in my tracks. I am Iktomi. I've been the mirror to others reflecting selves. I've known love that can't help but love. And I've been close to that hurting way of love. I flew with the eagles until I fell from the nest. I ran with the wolves, then got lost from the pack. From the earth, wind cave memories, one with the sky, time of different motions, dog days dreamer, chasing the neon woven into minds. From my place in line, I fell out of order. I've been here, I've been there, I've been anywhere, and I haven't been anywhere, and I'll be back again. I am Iktomi. Imagine running out of imagine, mistaking authority for power, weaving life's free spirit into patterns of control. In the reality of many realities, how we see what we see affects the quality of our reality. We are children of earth and sky, DNA, descendant, now ancestor, human being, physical spirit, bone, flesh, blood as spirit, metal, mineral, water as spirit. We are in time and space, but we're from beyond time and space. The past is part of the present. The future is part of the present. Life and being are interwoven. We are the DNA of Earth, Moon, planets, stars. We are related to the universal. Creator created creation, spirit and intelligence with clarity, being and human as power. We are a part of the memories of evolution. These memories carry knowledge. These memories carry our identity. Beneath race, gender, class, age, beneath citizen, business, state, religion, we are human beings. And these memories are trying to remind us human beings. Human beings, it's time to rise up, remember who we are. I think I want to talk a little bit about who we are. Because, see, reality is based upon our perception of reality. <laughs> it's what it is. But we really need to understand that. See, and I think one of the objectives in life is to understand. It's not enough to know. Right? I know how to turn on the TV, but I can't even begin to understand how it works. So it's not enough to know. So I think one of the purposes that life teaches us is, is the further we make it into life, is the more coherency we have left and we will understand. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a reality 
where I'm surrounded by all these beings that don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. And because they don't know who they are, they don't know where they are, they don't understand the language that they speak, so there's a general confusion and chaos that just takes place in their reality. It's almost like, you know, the way they make all the little chaos go inside of an internal combustion engine, you know, and all the sparks and all the stuff just fly in it, and it, makes, it creates an energy that runs something. Well, anyway, it's almost like this is the perceptual reality that is being carried around in the human consciousness to make this. So anyway, who we are, we're human beings. And the DNA of the human being, our bone, flesh, and blood is literally made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth. We are literally shapes and forms of the earth. That's who we are. And we have being. Our being comes from our relationship to the sun and to the universe. Because our relationship to the sun, I mean, let's be, you know, be very coherent and clear about this. Without the sun, we would not have life. All right, it's almost like the rays of light that the sun represents and brings to the earth. See, this is the sperm that gives life to the womb that earth is. So our relationship to power and our relationship to the reality of power is connected to that relationship. Anyway, what I see, the human, the being part, the being part of human is being mined <laughs> through the human experience. See, they're mining us. And whoever they are, I don't have the names, but I'll, you know, I'm a, we'll just figure some of that out on our own because, you know, you know, and I'm sure they have names. I'm real sure that they do, but, they don't, but I can't say them to you because I don't, they don't want us to know their names maybe, right? Because what they're doing isn't really, you know, in a way it's like vampirism and a lot of things. But, but anyway, in a mechanical term, we're being mined. And the being part of human is being mined through the logic of the human. Right? And, and uh, the emotions of the human. The being of spirit, the spirit of being, is what is being mined through the logics and emotions of the human in order to run the system. I mean, this is the purpose of technologic civilization. They call it technologic for a very specific reason. This isn't an accident, okay? <laughs> you know? It truly isn't. But the purpose of the civilization, and so one of the civilizing processes is to erase Memories, right? To erase memories because we have, we have ancestral memory. It's encoded in the DNA. It's a genetic memory. See, but you, you look at how technologic civilization and everywhere that it goes, the longer it's there, the more isolated the human beings, but they're not called human beings. They're workers and citizens and et cetera, <laughs> right? Right? But the more isolated they feel, they no longer, you know, maybe they remember their grandparents or their great-grandparents. But see, you've got all that ancestral knowledge that's encoded in the DNA, but it's been cut off. So it can't activate, because if we're not conscious that it's there, then we can't, we, it just makes it difficult. See, this is a memory that, <laughs> that is very important for them to erase. All right? And it's about who we are. It's a memory of identity and self-reality. So anyway, we... Because we, we, are, we come from where we come from, every, every one of us is the descendant of a tribe. Every person in this room is a descendant of a tribe at some point in our ancestral evolution. Common collective genetic memory that's in there, you know, that's encoded, like I say, in the DNA. And for every individual, encoded in our individual DNA, all right, is the experience of our lineage from the very beginning whose whole perceptional reality was what I was just saying. All things have being. We're made up of the earth. All my relations pray to spirits. See, and they didn't pray to man or human form. The, the closest they came to it was they prayed to spirits that were called ancestors. Right? And because they were praying those ancestors for help and guidance, they understood that we were borrowing today from the past and the future. We're borrowing it from both places. So they had, this, they had this understanding of reality, so they knew that to keep the balance was the purpose. To, that was the purpose. The reason for being was to keep the balance. So this was like, you know, we, what I will call a spiritual perception of reality. And so because of the spiritual perception of reality, they understood that life was about responsibility. It wasn't about the abstraction of freedom. It was about responsibility. That life was about responsibility. So the spiritual perception of reality was based upon that. We were the children of the earth. The earth was our mother. The sky, the sun and the sky, this was our fathers, and, right? But this was, 
And, and our reality worked for us. This morning, the mirror didn't know who I was today. I remember some of the whatever happened to's. Then sometimes I'm too occasional to understand or comprehend. What I believed I believed was because I was delusional. There's no other explanation. Clinging to the program, obviously, is the obvious lie. The past is more than a memory. Experiencing the future before the fantasy was the dream. Fantasy is the leftovers, a toxic waste from mining the dream. It's a perceptional thing. This technologic mental state is this reality or more desperate lies, manufacturing perceptions, packaging free thinking into reacted thought. Sometimes when it rains, it's not that simple when the sky has reasons to cry. This evening, the mirror saw that I looked kind of familiar tonight. In our common collective genetic ancestral mind, not a one of our ancestors went for the new show. <laughs> Nobody wanted, they wouldn't buy the tickets. <laughs> so the show was going to die. <laughs> so the show decided rather than it die, it would make our ancestors die until they accepted the show. And this is what happened. <laughs> it happened to all of us. Whatever happened to the Indians here, trust me, it happened to the tribes of Europe. You know, it started happening to them 3,000 years before it happened to us. So by the time the descendants of the tribes of Europe got here, they had it down. <laughs> you know, they were very efficient. They could do in a couple hundred years what it took. <laughs> well, I mean, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> Moths and other sacred wings. Butterflies and bees whisper, in breath of the wind, blessed way, blessing way things. Dreams are the mind's streams, thought pictures of the spirit. There are dreams of the day, there are dreams of the night. Thinking and dreaming are related. Dreams of the day, we make our own. Dreams of night, part of eternal stone. There are dream takers, taking from dream worlds, Taking dreams as a way of stealing thoughts. Turning minds inside and out. Dream slavers want to change our connections to ourselves. Mess with our dreams. Make us unsure. Unclear about right and wrong. Feed our dreams and instincts to industrial profit machine. Difference between dream and fantasy. Reality and illusion. Center and no center. Dreams of the day keep our spirit alive, our creative mind, who we really are. With dreams we can create and heal, follow our original purpose. Dreams are protection, good medicine. Blessed way, blessed way things. Sun and moon continue. We are all on one journey. So in our collective genetic ancestral memory, we had the experience of encountering the technologic perceptional reality. Because somewhere as this thing unfolded and refined itself as it was spreading over the planet, a religious perceptional reality was used to replace a spiritual perceptional reality. All right? Because the spiritual sense of rea reality, you're connected to everything, man. <laughs> you know, you're connected. But in the religious perceptional reality, see, you committed a crime for being born, see, you're f forgetting here. <laughs> I didn't make this up. <laughs> I'm not making it up now. <laughs> right? And so anyway, in order to be justify being here, <laughs> to get to stay, right, you had to submit to the male dominator chain of command, the authoritarian system. See, in this new religious reality said that, you know, well, now there's one, there's one God. The gods battle it out amongst themselves, see. <laughs> see, I can't envision, to me, I've never been able to envision gods or goddesses. I can't imagine a creator in a human form. I, I mean, no, you know, I can't. And I think our, our road, our path to trouble started when we started to do it that way. 
All right, I, you know, looking at the earth as the mother and these things, you know, call her the goddess, whatever, and this and that. See, but I don't, I don't go with God because I know that's a limited perceptional reality. See, they forced it on us. But the trouble came, see, when, when we decided that the creator entity had a human form. See, because then that, that rationalized and justified mistreating the rest of the natural world. All right? I mean, sexism and racism came out of this perceptional change. Because once the earth, you know, under the new God thing, see, the earth was no longer the mother. The earth was the property of this new God. And, and uh, all God's children, see, God didn't have a lot then, but they were very mean. So their numbers <laughs> expanded through terror. See, but God's children, was the, their job and objective was to subdue the earth for this God. So in order to achieve that objective, they had to create sexism. See, sexism has got to do with how we live with the earth. And racism, because now the per- earth was property, you know, and all spiritual value was away, was away from the earth, you know. Real spiritual value was now a religious perceptional thing, and, right? So it wasn't all-encompassing. It wasn't just a part of the reality anymore. So not a one of our people really went for this. Because it's like, you know, this is a major perceptional reality change. But anyway, we're, we're, we committed a moral crime for getting here, so now we had to submit to that world view. To me, coherently to me, it's clearly a blatant, a blatant, very blatant, perceptional altering how one perceives reality. I mean, it's brainwashing intensified at its maximum, Right? Because our ancestors were forced to see life differently in order to remain just physically alive. All right, you know, it's like, I, I don't really know that much about what happened to Europe, but I would suggest every person of European descendancy that you go and you study. You want to know more about you, who, your, your reality? Go and study your tribal ancestry and see how you got civilized. <laughs> All right? See how you got civilized. Because terrible things happened. And these terrible things, these are what altered the perceptional reality. See, and because the basic, basic part of this, and that altering of the pe- perceptional reality, what we're getting down to is, is it made us become irresponsible as human beings. Because, see, we can blame the bad guys for being bad guys, but that don't work. It's not enough. It's about human beings remembering their spiritual, real- their spiritual identity and accepting the responsibility from that perceptional reality. Taking responsibility. Because the bad guys only get away with what they get away with because we don't take responsibility. Because there's a difference between blaming somebody for something and taking responsibility. So when Columbus got here, he got off the boat and he said to the first people he saw, who are you? And the first people he saw said, we're human beings. And Columbus said, oh, Indians. and, and right now when I'm talking Columbus is every descendant of the tribe of Europe that came. <laughs> We're not talking one person here. We're talking a mindset. All right? This is a, a mentality that came, the Columbus mentality, we name it. <laughs> right? because, but it's about discovering. This is, you know, it's like almost like this is when the virus got here. And this is how long it's been here. But because you know, we've never had this disease before, we have no natural, we, can't, we don't have an immunity to it. But if we can survive the ravages of this disease, we will evolve an immunity to it because we are the part of the earth, and that's what happens. <laughs> right? Anyway, anyway, Columbus got here. And he didn't know what it meant to be a human being. See, that perceptional reality of being a human being and what it really meant had been erased from the descendants of the tribes of Europe by the time they got here. So when, when, we, when we introduced ourselves to the European a, as human beings, they just didn't get it. It wasn't a part of their perceptional reality. They might know how to say the words, right? But being a human being had changed in their reality, right? We know there was an Inquisition. And this Inquisition went on for four or 500 years in Europe. The purpose of the Inquisition was to alter the perceptional reality of the descendants of the tribes of Europe to make them believe and see reality the way the church wanted them to believe and see reality. The church called it, they waged a war for possession, for possession, this is important, they waged a war for the possession of the souls of the godless heathens. And to be a godless heathen, you just didn't believe in God. (laughs) It wasn't part of your reality. 
Or another way of becoming a godless heathen was to question the authority of the church to do this. See, and I, again, I'm not making this up. You know, this, this, this did transpire. These things did happen. And they killed as many people as they could, I guarantee it, in order to get the other ones to submit. So they killed as efficiently as they could with the technology they had at their disposable, disposal at that time, all right, and because they created a rationalization as to why to do it, so it just became as efficient as they could do. And at some point, the descendants of the tribes of Europe no longer knew what it meant to be a human being. <laughs> they just didn't know. They didn't want to know. So the descendants of the tribes of Europe, in the end, <laughs> had to love what they feared, which was there to possess them. See, and I think it messed up love in a lot of ways, you know, that they haven't unsorted yet. <laughs> no offense, but... <laughs> But anyway, all of this took place through our intelligence. Our intelligence. Now, whoever it is we pray to, right? whoever it is we pray to, however we pray, whatever, however we do that, all right? I think that we have an obligation and a responsibility, and it's about respect. If we respect our creator, then we should use our intelligence as intelligently as we can as often as we can. And that means with clarity and coherency. That means to activate and respect our intelligence and activate the thinking process so that it's going the way we want it to be because that's why it was given to us. Our intelligence, as, a hum as the human being part of all of this reality that's going on, we were given intelligence. This is what was there to help us through the evolutionary reality, to ride the balance, so to speak, of the evolution with our intelligence. Our, it's our medicine, it's our protection, it's our self-defense. Those fears and doubts and insecurity in one's daily mind and reality, how much do they affect, affect one's daily mind and reality? How much do they affect the ones of the people around them that they're connected to and cared about, that they care about? So how, what, what's the repercussions of the fears and the doubts and insecurity? Because I guarantee you, every day when we get up, we use our intelligence to create those effects. So it isn't that we're not using our intelligence or we can't use our intelligence. We can't stop using our intelligence. But it's about as human beings taking the responsibility to be as clear as one possibly can be about it and use our intelligence the way our creator gave it to us to use. <laughs> Keep the balance. Our intelligence. So this is everything that ever happened. Had to change the perceptual reality, this, the, the battleground had to take place. The real battleground may have been the bleeding and the dying, but it has to do with the intelligence to alter the perceptual reality. So again, about respect. See, if we respect our creator, we have a responsibility to recognize our intelligence and use it as clearly and coherently as we possibly can. Otherwise, we're just pretending. We're just being delusional and rationalizing and justifying and just telling ourselves a big lie. If we do not use our intelligence as intelligently as we possibly can, that's how we show respect to our creator. See, and you can't say you don't know because I just told it to you. <laughs> All right? So, I mean... When you vote for the lesser of the two evils, I condemn you. <laughs> what the f*** you doing? Actually, if you vote for either one of the evils, I condemn you. <laughs> what the f*** you doing? <laughs> By our acceptance of the lesser of the two evils, so to speak, we're using our intelligence to create what goes on. See, I don't vote. <laughs> I never have... I vote in Amsterdam, <laughs> whatever that means, <laughs> right? <laughs> Picked a winner, too. <laughs> we didn't have to have recounts, so we knew. <laughs> but I don't vote because, I mean, <laughs> my reasons for not voting are very valid. See, when they created the voting system here, the democracy here, when they created it, I was the majority. <laughs> hey, look at me over here. Oh, I see you, so you're the enemy. <laughs> you can't play. <laughs> so the little old majority rule thing came out of the smallest number of people, all right, the smallest number of people on the entire hemisphere, continent. <laughs> all right, they decided it was going to be majority rule. 
There's something about it, right, that I don't trust. I inherently don't <laughs> trust it. And I don't understand why you do, <laughs> okay? So now that we're the smallest numerical minority on our own land base, they say, come vote. <laughs> Now, so in, this, in that scenario, who's stupid, me or them? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and I'm bringing this up about democracy for this reason. And it's about coherency and using our intelligence. I think that every generation of human beings has a responsibility to decide how they, how they and their immediate descendants will live with the earth. I think it's our responsibility. All right? I think it's our responsibility to do that. And I think when I look at democracy as a native person, see, to me, it's just another chain. You know, freedom is a lie. <laughs> you know, democracy. I mean, you know, think about it. Every democracy had a, land, had a land-owning class. Every democracy had some, tor some form of slavery. Every democracy had some form of sexism. And I'm saying this not because I'm trying to overthrow anybody's anything, because, you know, it's just, you know, it's not about that. It's about, oh yeah, it's about the next generation. We live in an evolutionary reality. And maybe it needs to evolve. And maybe in the, in the, in the best interest of our seventh generation, it may be the enemy. But I don't mean just it by itself. I'm talking about all of the industrial bases of control systems, whether it's democracy or fascism or socialism or any one of these industrial bases and mechanisms to control the mass of people, because every one of these systems have a small class and an ethnic rich, an industrial ruling class and a planetary ethnic rich. And every one of these governments, no matter what they call them, they serve that master. So don't misunderstand me. This isn't about, you know, this is about a perceptional reality here. I come from a tribe, and whatever's been going on in my evolutionary journey, I still remember that. I'm confused about a lot of things, but I remember that. I remembered it when I was born. I've never been a question about the memory. But they're trying to take that memory away. But the memory of the tribe, see, 100 years ago, what's this, 120 years ago, Geronimo said the Americans, and they're messed up, you know? Said it. He called them the Americans. See, so I feel a kinship to those ancestors and what they saw and what, and what they tried to stand up against. I feel more of a kinship to them than I do to be a lapdog to this system and promote its lie. All right, because I think it's irresponsible. And I think that when people are afraid to think about what's be, and when people are afraid to think about what needs to be thought about, that's the danger of the lie. Casualty of war, afraid to think. You know, so I will say democracy because you're not supposed to say anything bad about democracy, but I'll say it. And I'm not saying what I'm saying. I don't look at it as I'm saying something bad. I'm just saying this is what it is. You heard, you've heard the other side, so I want to say this side. Right? Freedom of speech. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Let's go to freedom of speech. <laughs> See, I think the part of the lie there, <laughs> all right, it should be about responsibility of thought. <laughs> Freedom of speech, responsibility of thought. Responsibility of thought will then take care of free speaking. But freedom of speech, or freedom, it isn't so much about, it's the, it isn't about freedom of speech, let me make this more, the idea of freedom. See, words, words, every word has its own meaning because it makes its own sound in a vibratory world, all right? So every word has its own meaning. You know, so like democracy, that noise, that sound, noise, whatever it is. My ancestors, 30 generations ago, never heard that sound. That noise was never made here on this land base. It's alien to this. Right? So that, you know, democracy and whatever, all, all of these things. In a way, in a way, he was just killing time. Or was time killing him? Which way did up go after he found down? Away in a city, it's lonesome in town. Away in a country, all is not fair. Away in a heart, he's been locked out. Away in a dream, who has he become? 
a way in a mind been through the wrong, a way in a society that just can't see, a way in a way how it feels to be free. He was just killing time, or was time killing him? Which way did up go after he found down? And for us, so about words. So I think the word freedom shouldn't be used so frivolously. You know, and I think that somewhere in the course of this, it is about responsibility. This is a word that needs to float around in our, in our consciousness. We need to plant that seed and let it nurture in our consciousness that life's about responsibility. Because we will synchronize closer to what it is we seek in our life. Because it's very difficult to deal with an abstraction of freedom by a people who don't know who they are and what they're saying, you know? Okay. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> I'm not talking about you unless I am, right? <laughs> and believe is another word, right? Freedom, believe, democracy. Right. Believe. See, I come from people who have beliefs. And I'm a part of those beliefs. And I respect those beliefs. Because they're a part of my reality. But then on the other hand, every time I hear somebody say, I believe, it makes me cringe inside. <laughs> so I cringe a lot. <laughs> I think, well, what? Now hold it. Misuse of a word here. Throwing the wrong sound out in the vibratory world. It should be more <laughs> in harmony. <laughs> right? The sound. And I think believe might be a word that's not in harmony, although that's the illusion that's been created that we've been led to believe. <laughs> All right. But see, I think it's better to say either I know or I don't know, <laughs> or I think. I think. I have intelligence. I think. My intelligence has been drugged with <laughs> misinformation. My, my intelligence has been, on a, uh, been sent on a trip. I'm tripping, so I believe. <laughs> uh, I mean, can we understand it that way? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Friends. <laughs> so it's more passive, right? Believing. And I think we should respect our intelligence, and it should always be active. <laughs> you know? It should be active. If we can create our own daily insecures and miseries and fears, we can use that same intelligence to create a whole much better reality, I'm telling you. See, and the collective reality, all the causes and movements and the things that we feel are right and that we chase, see, that reality is not going to really change until we change this other one. And here's why I'm going to say this, because this, this thing has been going on for like 3,000 years. <laughs> you know, everybody's been protesting and standing up to see, but, but as, it income, as it gets us and alters our perception of, of self and reality, Right? The same old struggles come, see? It's just a new generation saying new words, dancing to new music, to new instruments. But it's the same old thing. So check out a little bit of Paris or France in 1430. and <laughs> Check that place out, man. Right? It's the same thing. Check out the rise of industrial civilization or the, the industrial revolution in America in the, 17, late, in the 1800s. Same thing. So the same struggle by the human beings to just try to be, stay alive all right, has been going on for a long time. So what I'm saying, what I mean is like, so it isn't that we haven't been trying for such a long time. We've been trying to write a thing to make it more ride the balance. So I think maybe what we should consider really needs to consider the, the synchronization is where the being, it's us who are being mined. So we need to interfere with that mining process. And so we need to become as clear as we can. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility. There are no rights and no freedom without responsibility. I guarantee it. It's about responsibility. And that's not, you know, and not, to not be afraid of the word. See, I think responsibility, I think that's the liberator's word. <laughs> right? You want to be free, then be responsible. <laughs> right? You want to be free, then be responsible. I think that's the liberator's word. 
Because then we are taking direct action with our intelligence. Because, see, there's not anything wrong with us. There's, I mean, how we perceive reality. <laughs> but from this moral, moralistic thing, there's not something wrong with us. We really need to be, we need to be real to ourselves. We will get closer to synchronizing our balance. But the first thing is we need to be real to ourselves. We need to be able to face ourselves because if we can't face ourselves, then, you know, <laughs> we should think about that. Because the other thing is, whoever it is, the, the, the coming generations, the creator, the, whoever it is, if we're not willing to face ourselves, all right, then in some kind of a way, we diminish our respect for them. Because we're, we are here to be real. But if we would look at ourselves clearly, the Diné, now we'll have a way of saying going to the fourth mind, which means to look at everything. But you, you rise out of it, you look at it from outside, from the top, the bottom, all the way around, from the inside, you look at it from under it, you look at it, the, the thing for every way that you can, and you see it for what it is, and then you, you act. See, and we need to understand to do that without judgment. It's not our responsibility or our right to judge. You can judge nothing without judging yourself. It's just that reality, you know. So what's the trip, you know? And, and it's already been determined that most of us, we've judged ourselves negatively. <laughs> Through our fears and our doubts and our insecurities. So let's look at that thing about judgment. It's, not our, it's our responsibility to see clearly and learn from what we learn from our clarity and our coherency. That's our responsibility. It's not our responsibility to judge and condemn. So in order to be real to ourselves, you know, we've got to be careful about rational, self-rationalization and justification and these little things that pop up disguised as something else. We need to be real to ourselves. And if our reality, if our reality, if in our reality there are shameful things, all right, then don't lie to yourself about it. Because a shameful thing isn't necessarily really a shameful thing is how we perceive. But if there are, I'll put it this way, if there are things in our reality that we're not comfortable with, all right, then we should see it for what it is without judgment. And if we can't live with it, it will, it will evolve out of our behavior pattern. You know, and if it bothers us, but we can live with it, then it'll stay. And the things that we do good on the other end, the things that we perceive from that perception, see, everything should be seen exactly for what it is. Because it's also time to turn another thing that goes back into the spiritual reality that's been, re that's been altered by the, the religious reality, and that reality is, see, life needs to be approached, I think, See, there's too much pride. See, and, and to me, I see pride, the, the way I see pride in some ways used, see, I think pride is something I'm proud of you. See, I think it's something you give, but it's not something you take. Because every time I've ever seen anyone take pride, they take too damn much of it, and then they fuck the thing up. <laughs> I've seen it organizationally, I've seen it individually, I've been the player, <laughs> right? So I think, you know, maybe in life is really more about humility. See, we come from an ancestral past, a part of the genetic memory. See, where humility was connected to our participation in reality, and we were grateful and we were thankful. See, so many times, again, out of using the word as a habit, see, many times, all right, we, when we say, I'm proud, really we're happy. <laughs> and wouldn't it be more clear to just say that? <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> or I'm glad, or I appreciate it. But when did these things that come from the being, the pride comes from the human, but these things come from the being. Because, I mean, it's these types of alterations that were done to us, all right, that keep us from synchronizing. And I don't, you know, and I don't have, and there are, there is no answer. The only answer is, is that we have the intelligence and the responsibility and the ability all right, to create the solutions to the problem that we're confronted with. Because there are no solutions now. I guarantee you, you know, you can, you can deal with the lesser of the two evils, but there is no political solution. And I think you know that. I think everyone knows that, right? But they just feel powerless to do it, so they want to avoid dealing with that reality. And I'm saying, hey, let's look at reality and deal with reality. I got intelligence. I accept the challenge. I have the ability. This is why I was given it. So there are some miscalculations in me. I kind of messed up a few times along the way. So what? I learned from it. It's part of who I am, right? 
But that doesn't mean the coherent parts and the clear parts aren't clear and aren't coherent. <laughs> because they, cry, they try, somehow, in some subtle way, it's been created into the human, into the human beings' minds. They say, you've got to be the perfect person in order to get it done. But at the same time, all right, at the same time, right, <laughs> we're not, nothing's perfect, and we all know that and say it. <laughs> it's like a contradiction. So just accept ourselves for who we are and show respect to our Creator, all right, by, by using the gifts that the Creator gave to us. And I'm not trying to get anyone, you know, to... And I'm not trying to get you to believe me or <laughs> not believe me or any of that, right? Because, but it's really about thinking, <laughs> you know? The objective is about thinking. Because our relationship to power, I'm going to start to wind out of here, but, but our relationship to power is connected in our relationship to clear, coherent use of our intelligence. All right? You had some rain here, right? And some wind. Okay. So let's look at us. Every human being is a raindrop. <laughs> All right? And when enough, enough of the raindrops become clear and coherent, they then become the power of the storm that the existing reality has to endure, and it, ha it can't arrest it, indict it, change it. It has to deal with it in a realistic way. Well, maybe human consciousness, maybe we're all snowflakes or raindrops, or we're all pieces of little, trem we're little trem tremblers in the earth. <laughs> right? Maybe we're all part of that. See, when we become clear with our coherency, then, then this collective thing happens, and you have power. And on the way to that power is the power that we connect to as we live our lives. Because I'm telling you, you know, how many of you feel powerless to deal with your life? And I'm telling you, if there's anybody in here that feels powerless to deal with your life, you know, uh, don't take two aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> for the next generation, for the next generation that's coming, I think an understanding about the value and reality of the intelligence, <laughs> of our intelligence. I think it's very crucial that they have that understanding to make it through this, because we're being mined at a rapid rate. And I think it's very crucial, all right, to the continuation of the living species, not the humanoid species, you know, I mean the living. So it's got to be put into the intelligence, them to have an understanding, the next generations. But the only way we can do it is we can't tell it to them. I mean, we can say it to them, but we have to show it to them. Because we are a part of an evolutionary reality, and we will influence the evolution. We will, because our intelligence is always active, so it's just about taking responsibility. But we will influence the evolutionary reality. And we can influence the evolutionary reality out of a base of lost and frustration and self-judgment and things that's been going on for the last 300 years or 400 years here which has led to this situation, or we can use some clarity and coherency and influence the evolutionary reality in a more clear and coherent way. Every struggle that we must engage with, whether it's political or economic or social, all these struggles are necessary, all right, to keep, to keep the cir <laughs> circulation going. The other part of that reality is we have to outthink what it is that, ch that we're challenged by or that oppresses us or does whatever it is. We have to outthink it. It's that simple. The first act, the first act of being free and liberation, all right, is the act of taking our intelligence back, taking our imagination back, our ability to think. That's the first act of liberation. That is the very first act, all right, of conscious liberation. The first, the first steps towards respect for the creator is run, understanding that we have that intelligence and doing the second act. It's our intelligence. And for our next generation, you know, we, we have a responsibility to direct as much intelligence into that as we can. Because this thing about life and death, you know, this, this technologic reality has been around for three or 4,000 years, however long it's been around, you know. But its whole reality is based upon death, so therefore, at some point, it must die. Our whole objective as human beings is to stay alive. <laughs> To get it, I mean really alive, not surviving and existing. I'm talking about alive, connected to life and living. See, we have to outlast it because we can't outfight it because its violence and its aggressive mindset, all right, is beyond parallel. 
But that doesn't mean that it's powerful. That just means it's violent and it's aggressive and it's without parallel and you better be damn careful of it. But that's what that means about power, our relationship to clarity and coherency and the use of our intelligence is our relationship to power and we can outthink it. Simple math, simple math. It's a mathematical thing. In the authoritarian state system, only X amount of people are given permission to think. Okay? So at some point, theoretically, we will out surround them if we will just do what is necessary to get there. <coughs> Your descendants and my descendants depend upon us, right, to keep the reality of the living alive. And, and we are going to influence the outcome no matter what we do. So all I'm talking about is, well, let's take some responsibility, right? And, and let's influence it in a more clear and coherent way. Outthink them. Trust ourselves and our ability to think. And each and every one of us was given just as much intelligence as we need. It's not a contest. <laughs> I'm going to close now. Uh, and I thank you for being here and, and getting whatever you got out of this, right? Uh, I'm not responsible. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm just this rag doll, and there are these entities just here. <laughs> I want to vent today, so here, get him. <laughs> Raven brought beaded serpent, and the Alaskan thunder. Realities yet to come. Good thoughts are good way life. Wrapped in the universe, the unborn sleep in dream time. Day in the sun is on its way. Think good thoughts, thoughts of lightened minds. Dream dreams dreaming brings. Sense rush of newfound find. View where harmonies sing. Follow the sky into the blue. You are part sky, sky is part you. There are stars that bring the night. There are thoughts to bring clear sight. Thinking good makes for strong heart, nourishment for spirit and soul, a good path, a good way to give. Belief creates what we believe. Good words, good thoughts, good actions, a way human beings live. Raven brought beaded serpent in the Alaskan thunder, and I thank you for being here.